Good morning, everybody. You're very welcome to our webinar this morning entitled Charities Collaborating with Each Other and Their Employees. We in Mason, Hayes and Curran are delighted to be hosting this webinar in association with our friends in Charities Institute Ireland and in PwC. And we're also delighted that Thomas Mulholland from the Charities Regulator has joined us as a speaker today. A big thank you from all of us on the screen to all of you, our cl clients and our audience for tuning in. I'm Neve Callaghan. I'm Head of Charities and Not-for-Profit in Mason, Hayes and Curran, and I'm delighted to be both your host and your chair for this morning. Before we get into the content of our webinar, I wanted to mention a few things about the dreaded technology. Firstly, to let you know that this event is being recorded, which is great because it will mean that you will all get a link to the recording over the next couple of days. As it's been recorded, there's a new function apparently on Zoom, that, so there might be a little box that appears on your screen asking you to accept the fact that you are in a recorded session. So if you'd like to click that, otherwise it will hamper your view of the screen. All of your cameras, as in the attendees, have been switched off centrally and unfortunately you've all been muted, so we can neither see you nor hear you, but we do know that you're there. The question and answer function is open, so we'd be delighted if you'd like to send in any questions you have and we'll deal with them at the end. And many thanks to those of you who sent in some questions already when you registered. You're all watching the screen through my colleague Aoife Doran's screen and Aoife is managing our slides today. Not every speaker has slides, but those who do will probably mention Aoife, please go to the next slide. So apologies if you find that slightly annoying, but we found that that was better than trying to share the slides with so many different speakers. Now, despite everyone's best efforts, unfortunately, sometimes there's just a glitch with technology, but please bear with us. Everybody has shared their script with somebody else. So we hope that this will be, you know, pretty faultless, if you like, and everybody will just do their very best. I hope I'm not jinxing it saying all of that. So anyway, collaboration. Collaboration is the theme of our webinar. And it has often been considered and used by charities when trying to increase their impact and effectiveness, effectiveness or simply when they're just trying to survive. However, sometimes I definitely found in the past that there was a view that reaching out to other charities to collaborate was maybe seen as a sign of weakness or the old view of, if you like, not wanting to let your neighbours know that you're struggling a bit, put the head down and keep going was quite prevalent in the sector. It's our experience that that view has changed and that COVID has definitely further increased the level of collaboration between charities, be it joining together for a digital fundraising campaign on a once off event or entering into agreements with each other regarding the joint delivery or taking over of a particular service. And sometimes realizing that merging with another charity is the best way to continue to deliver on a charitable purpose and benefit the stakeholders. So regardless of the form it takes, collaboration is definitely now seen as being both healthy and good as both solutions and new ideas spring from it. And we hope that that's the experience that most of you on this webinar are having. COVID, at least in the early stages, I found brought a feeling of we're all in this together. And I have to say, I got a bit fed up of Ryan Tuberty telling us that every Friday night, but it definitely encouraged greater collaboration. Everyone was struggling and adapting at the same time, and it was very easy to reach out and help and reach out and be helped. COVID also made reaching out to other charities so easy. It was as easy to reach out to another charity as it was previously to speak to a colleague who was at the next desk because we were all working from home, as you can see most of our, us on the screen still are. As well as collaborating with other charities, COVID has obviously brought new ways of working. Whether you're working in a charity like all of our audience or you're in PwC or here in Mason, Hayes and Curran, Collaborating with employees is key to ensuring that employers know where they stand. Employees know where they stand because it's all very new for all of us. And that collaboration will help in the movement back into the office. So that's what our webinar is about today. It's about the benefits, ease and joys of collaborating. Not the doomsday, keep the head down and plow on, or even it's merger or bust, which was sometimes the view that was taken. Let's open our minds and for the next 90 minutes at the most, 
let's listen and hear from some of the experts on the screen about the benefits of collaboration in all its forms. So Aoife, on the screen now, you'll see a photo of our speakers, and I'm going to take this opportunity to thank each and every one of them for sharing their expertise and their views. And as everybody knows, these webinars take an awful lot longer to prepare for than any of us ever think. So many thanks to each and every one of you. And I'd also like to thank my colleagues Catherine Madden and Aoife Doran for all their assistance in arranging today. I'm going to introduce each speaker just when they come to the virtual podium, if you like, to speak. Now on the screen, you'll see our agenda, Aoife. As you can see, it's absolutely jam-packed. So without further ado, I'm going to ask our first two speakers, Ashling Fitzgerald and Daniel Chan, to the virtual podium. Ashling is well known to most of you. She is a director in PwC, where she heads up PwC's not-for-profit practice. Ashling will give a brief introduction to what she and her colleagues in PwC in their Dublin office are seeing in the charity sector in Ireland at the moment. And I'll then let Ashling introduce her colleague, Dan, from their London office. Thank you, Ashling. Thanks for that introduction, Eve. So I, I might start by saying a few words about what I'm seeing here on the ground in Ireland, and then I'm going to ask my colleague Dan that Neve just mentioned to share with us some of the perspectives on what he's seeing in the UK from a PwC UK perspective. We've been working remotely now for over a year, as, as many of you have been, and as Neve has said, many of the charities we talk to still have most of their staff working remotely, and yet most charities have very positive stories to tell about how they have responded with great agility and resilience to the COVID-19 crisis. In the case of many of the fundraising charities that I deal with, their year-on-year -year fundraising income has outperformed all expectations, and in some cases it's even up on previous years, notwithstanding the fact that most of their physical in-person events had to be cancelled. So let's talk a little bit about the theme of today, collaboration. And I can genuinely say that over the last year or so, I've witnessed lots and lots of opportunities for charities to collaborate, both with each other and with various stakeholders in ways that I've never seen them collaborating before. And this has been brought about by all the new ways that we're working digitally together. I too have witnessed many of the examples that Neve has referenced. I've seen various charities collaborating with their digital partners to come up with new ways of raising funds. I've seen lots of alliances and partnerships made between charities and various charity ambassadors with a view to using those partnerships to gain momentum and support and to increase exposure for the charity. I've also seen a number of charities, particularly in the homelessness sector, coming together to collaborate on specific projects to deal with new and emerging challenges that, that have come about as a result of the pandemic. I know that my colleagues in the UK have recently been involved in some research on how, how charities can stay relevant in the current climate. And one of the themes explored as part of that research is the whole area of charity alliances, various different forms of charity alliances. So I invited Dan Chan to come here this morning to share with us some of what he's seeing in the UK in relation to charity alliances and mergers, and to perhaps talk us through some of the findings from the research that PwC UK was involved in on this topic. So good morning, Dan, and, and thanks very much for being with us this morning. Hopefully the next time I invite you over to Dublin, you'll be able to come in person uh, rather than to this virtual event. Uh, I wanted to start, I suppose, by just asking you to give us a general overview of what you're seeing in the UK in terms of the merger and alliance spectrum. Are you actually seeing many charities coming together formally and, and what format of those are, are those alliances taking? Thanks very much, Annette. It's really great to be here with you all this morning and to share my experience of what I see in the UK on the subject of alliances. There is a wide spectrum of alliances um, that I'm seeing from formal mergers to a wide range of different types of collaborations, some with narrow aims uh, and many with broader purposes. Um, and we have seen these different types to varying degrees in the UK historically. Uh, as Neve did mention in her introduction, formal alliances or mergers have previously too often been viewed as a consequence of failure, particularly arising from financial distress. And this has certainly been no different uh, in the UK. The concept of mergers has therefore unfortunately been potentially unfairly tainted historically. But I do think it's important um, that we adopt a positive narrative when we talk about mergers and indeed different forms of alliances as a tool for achieving more for our causes. 
And the UK charities do frequently collaborate at a project level um, and do understand that causes can be better served by working together. Uh, but this can also be extended further with different opportunities going forward. Charities increasingly understand that they can go further with alliances and to better respond to the changing needs and funding patterns that are out there. And it is very common for charities to form networks and connections with each other these days. And for many, this is now seen as vital to achieving their mission. But as I said, formal mergers are, are still very much in the minority, particularly those uh, with a strategic aim uh, in mind rather than as a result of financial distress. So I did want to provide a couple of key uh, examples in the UK that happened over the past few years, uh, which were strategic uh, and were very well thought through and are recognised as, as some good practice examples uh, within the UK. The first one that I want to just talk through is around Breast Cancer Care and Breast Cancer Now, uh, which officially became one charity uh, in April 2019 under the name Breast Cancer Care and Breast Cancer Now. Um, as two individual charities, the boards of trustees of both of uh, the pre previous charities believe that they could achieve more together than they could apart. And they united around a shared ambition that by 2050, everyone who develops breast cancer would live um, and would be supported to live well. So the merger did provide an opportunity to connect the UK's largest breast cancer research community with the UK's largest breast cancer support community to speak with one clear voice for people affected by breast cancer and thus providing an end-to-end -end service uh, for users and beneficiaries. So from the research side to, to look at new um, either cures or treatments or support um, all the way to the actual delivery of the support itself and, and how those two could be really complementary to each other. Um, and therefore, the, the, the two boards saw it uh, fit to come together. Um, but this wasn't an easy journey. It did take a little time um, to, to make sure that all the details were right. Um, a, a number of different areas had to be considered in terms of the stakeholder engagement. And, and definitely lots had to be done to work together to make sure it worked. Uh, and it still continues as a successful charity um, today in its kind of new form. The second um, example I wanted to highlight is, is Asthma UK and British Lung Foundation Partnership. Um, and they came together um, on the 1st of January 2020, um, so just before the, the pandemic hit in the UK, uh, to become a new charity called the Asthma UK and British Lung Foundation Partnership. Um, the partnership, as the name suggests, builds uh, on an earlier joint working that has led to real and significant improvements and outcomes for people affected by lung disease, and hence why they thought it was appropriate to come together. Slightly different to the previous example, the British Lung Foundation Asthma UK would retain their individual identities and under their own names would continue research into asthma and lung diseases with information support being provided. However, there is a single board of trustees now and a single partnership chief executive and leadership team and was very much billed as a partnership of equals in this way. So a slightly different format to the previous one, but nonetheless um, very much built on a shared vision um, and collaboration together to do um, make the most difference for users and beneficiaries. In addition to the formal mergers that I mentioned, there are clearly also a wide range of other collaborations, which I suspect are more familiar to many of you. Uh, and clearly there have been greater discussions over recent years in relation to things like shared functions, both internally and externally, for example, around finance, technology, HR, and indeed fundraising, as, as Ashley mentioned. Then of course, the COVID-19 pandemic hit and the pandemic has impacted different charities in different ways. Um, in the UK and certainly has encouraged many charities to think differently and more specifically about their charitable purpose, particularly where resources have been constrained or where there has been greater uncertainty. And we've seen alliances come together in terms of a national voice, for example, to champion their causes or to ask for government support. There's been a greater focus on specific areas of charitable activity and referrals to other charities for different areas where they may not be a specialist. And certainly more conversations about formal alliances at trustee level although I do recognize there haven't been many strategic alliances announced publicly. Clearly the pandemic has led to some charities coming under significant financial pressure. And so there may well be some mergers that do happen as a result of this, uh, but hopefully this will be the exception rather than the rule. And looking ahead, I certainly do think there's greater potential to work together and to explore different ways of doing so formally and informally. And as Ashley mentioned, we at PwC UK have worked with the Chartered Institute of Fundraising and published a report titled Being More Radical and thinking differently. And this is focused on the concept of pivoting 
um, which is an organization's ability to identify new opportunities and to respond quickly with decisive action, um, as well as around mass participation, around consumption of services, um, and, and really convening movements in a, in a large number of people acting as a crowd to bring about change. But this report also covers alliances, which I'll talk about more shortly, um, but I would encourage you to look at the wider report, which can be found online. Thanks, Dan. And I suppose it is useful um, to get that overview of what's going on in the UK. Um, you know, the UK tends to be a step ahead of us in Ireland in terms of the whole regulatory environment. You, you've obviously, you know, had, had regulation for charities for a lot longer than ourselves. Um, fr from my perspective here, I've seen very little by way of formal charity mergers taking place in, in Ireland recently. You know, lots of maybe discussions and, and thoughts about it, but, but very little formal mergers actually taking place in practice. But as I mentioned earlier, I have seen lots of less formal alliances taking place. So I suppose I, I wondered then, Dan, I know you mentioned the two examples there from the UK, but from, from your perspective um, in terms of what you've seen in practice in the UK, what does a successful alliance look like? What does a successful alliance aim to achieve? No, absolutely. Um, a successful alliance, I guess, in my view, can take many different forms uh, and often have, uh, but often have common principles and themes that do drive their success. So from my experience, this typically includes organizational fit. So ensuring that there is some form of complementarity, as I mentioned earlier, um, there definitely needs to be a shared goal within the relationship. So uh, what is the aim of the alliance? Uh, and that needs to be very clear up front and, and, and bought in by everybody. There needs to be a degree of honesty and certainly about what is achievable and realistic. Um, and, and without that, um, if the aim is too unachievable, then, then certain things won't happen. Um, but, but also the additional support that's required. As I mentioned, there is lots of stakeholder management, project management um, and resources that will need to be invested to make it a success. And, and, and we should all be very clear up front about what that looks like. It's important to remember that why charities should explore alliances and this, um, but this includes a number of potential benefits as well. So for example, including appropriate division of resources, creating economies of scale, and hopefully driving efficiencies and maximizing the impact for users and beneficiaries. This can, as I mentioned earlier, include certain functions, including finance, IT, HR, fundraising, and having combined teams, uh, for example, but I, I, I know that um, you've also explored some other areas in, in, in Ireland, Ashley. I guess, Dan, you know, one thing that comes to mind from an Irish perspective here is, is the Charity Governance Code. And I, I know Thomas from the CRA is going to talk a little bit more detail about that later on. But I suppose one of the challenges faced by all Irish charities at the moment is that for the first time this year, they will need to confirm or otherwise um, th their compliance with the Charities Regulatory Code in, in, in time for their annual report filing, which will be due by October. So I guess, you know, from an Irish perspective, bringing together two charities in a formal merger type scenario would mean that you would only have one compliance record form, one set of governance controls and procedures uh, rather than two. I suppose, on the other hand, and it's important not to confuse the two here is, you know, where there are two separate charities coming together in some form of, you know, I suppose, less formal alliance for the purpose of say centralizing their finance function or their HR function, as you mentioned, you know, you would still have two separate charities in this case um, for the purpose of code compliance. So there, you know, there would be no, I suppose, economy of scale there in terms of code compliance. So I suppose the, the only scenario that that would actually work in terms of actually achieving a, a, you know, a saving in terms of code compliance would be if you had a formal merger where two, two entities legally form one. The other thing that comes to mind here in terms of benefit, I suppose, is, you know, the fact that you would, you know, in, in a formal legal merger situation, you would only have one governance structure going forward. So I suppose, what does that mean? It means one board to fill. It means one audit subcommittee, one finance subcommittee and, you know, and, 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 and so on and so on. Um, and I suppose, you know, that that probably will present a real benefit from from my experience. Charities are finding it more and more difficult to fill board positions in the current climate, not least because of the huge amount of responsibility that's attaching to these positions. And I know Thomas, um, again, from the CRA, will have some comments to make later on on the issue of board responsibilities with his regulatory hat on. Um, so, Dan, look, lots of benefits, lots of potential benefits there um, that, that, you know, that, that could help to make a, a successful alliance or merger. Um, I'm wondering, I suppose, from your experience, um, what, you know, why do some alliances not realise the impact that they've been set out to achieve? Yeah, no, and, and everything you said does apply in the UK context equally, I think. But, um, but in terms of why do some alliances not realise their impact, I, I believe that all charities set about 
about all their activities with good intentions and certainly try to make alliances work. But, but alliances are not easy and it does take um, hard work and commitment uh, from all parties. Um, and so um, and, and I, I've seen my fair share of alliances that haven't worked. So hopefully sharing some common pitfalls um, may also be helpful in others' journeys uh, around this. So potential challenges can include how charities try and do too much too quickly. Um, it comes back to the points I mentioned uh, just earlier around what makes an alliance successful and the importance around being honest about what is achievable and also what additional support or resources are needed to make that happen. Um, as I've mentioned, there's also a need for buy-in from all relevant stakeholders. This can definitely make or break an alliance. Um, it's important to understand any concerns or resistance um, and to actively and proactively address these, both internal and external. And it's vital that the leadership teams involved are fully on board and support the alliance. There have certainly been examples in the UK where alliances have not worked because it became obvious that there was a disagreement over the direction of travel within the charity's leadership. And this can be either at management or trustee level. And the identity of the alliance is also key. Uh, and in any alliance, there will be elements of give and take. Uh, it may be odd to say in a charity context, but the give aspect can sometimes be challenging in terms of ownership or control over certain areas. Uh, and so the split of responsibilities and accountabilities between the different charities is often very important in these discussions. There must be agreement and clarity over this. Um, otherwise, this could and certainly has given rise to conflict, animosity, uh, but also gaps uh, which don't enable the alliance to achieve its full potential. And any anything else, Dan, of, of relevance? I suppose we've kind of talked about the benefits, and and we've talked about you know where 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 the you know things might go wrong. Any other relevant points the charity should be considering, um, if they're considering at this point of embarking on on any form of alliance? No, absolutely. And if we go on to the next slide, um, as charities go about considering an alliance, whether formal or informal, or re-evaluating um, existing alliances, it's important to think through the following questions. Uh, are existing alliances having a sufficient impact on the mission? Um, have you got the right parts of the organisation engaged with the alliance and the partnership? Is ownership and control causing any challenges and to proactively mitigate these? Um, and what would change if you were to reframe the relationship with supporters for example, as a partnership for change. Um, all of these are really important just to make sure that you get right at the outset and to constantly reevaluate as you go through the journey. Um, and so from my perspective, just to sum, I guess charities working together is, is so important and a key aspect of what makes, for me, the charity sector special, um, to come together to help make the most difference for users and beneficiaries, and certainly placing charitable purpose at the heart of all that we do. But um, that's probably my perspective, Ashley. Thanks, Dan. And I suppose just before we finish up on this session, I just wanted to mention that our PwC summer charity newsletter is literally hot off the press. It was launched yesterday, I think, by email. Um, and it, it, it'll also be live on our, our, our website um, if anybody wants to download it. But there is an article in there covering the whole area of mergers and alliances, you know, which touches on some of the points that Dan has raised this morning. So if anybody wants to flick back over any of them, um, you know, feel free to, 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 to have a look at the newsletter and, and, and have a look at that article. But for now, I'd just like to say thank you very much for listening. And I'm going to hand you back to Neve to introduce the next speaker. Great. Many thanks, Ashling and Dan. That was very, very um, helpful. It's great to see that Dan's experience in the UK is very similar to ours here, that there is a very positive attitude towards any form of collaboration and different alliances. But it's definitely very clear from what Dan and Ashling have said that any engagement with other charities does require a lot of cooperation, collaboration, etc. Um, and thanks too for the name of the two recent mergers that have happened. I think it'd be great for anybody who is thinking about a merger who's listening in today to just keep an eye on those two charities, the merged charities that Dan has mentioned, just to see how their integration goes and how they start working together moving forward. So it was interesting to see something like that in real life. So now I'm going to invite my colleague, Alice Murphy, to the virtual screen. Um, we, Alice and I are going to do what some people refer to as a fireside chat, sitting under my Velux this morning. I'm definitely glad it's not beside a fire. Um, as most of you know, Alice is a partner and works with me in our, corp in our charities team in Mason, Hayes and Curran, and she'll be very well known to most of you. So Alice, um, Ashling and Dan have spoken about lots of different forms of alliances between charities. 
And I know that in our charities team, we often look at these alliances as, if you like, a spectrum of collaboration going from zero to complete merger, if you like. Maybe would you give us a flavour, Alice, of what we and our team are seeing on that spectrum of collaboration and what are the high level, if you like, legal issues, Alice, that you would give for each range along that spectrum? Thanks, Neve. So as I listen to Ashling and Daniel, I realise they're really mirroring what we hear so much from charities. We hear we'd like to partner, we'd like to collaborate. Coming at it from the Mason Hayes side, we want to protect you against the risks inherent in any collaboration. And how we do that depends, exactly as you said, Neve, on where the charity's idea or proposal lies on the spectrum of collaboration. So at one end of the spectrum, we have a loose ad hoc type alliance. This could be two charities coming together to launch a one-off fundraiser for their cause or a one-off project. Relevant legal issues for an ad hoc alliance would be, if it was a fundraising uh, alliance, obviously fundraising law and compliance, general legal compliance in the running of an event or a project. If there's data being collected, uh, are you aware of the GDPR? And a key risk mitigation factor, I think with any ad hoc alliance is that members of the public must understand what charities are participating and to whom are they donating money. So those are typical. Um, issues that we see at the very loose alliance or one-off alliance. Moving along the spectrum, uh, you can also, of course, consider an ongoing alliance. For example, would it make sense for you to join forces with another charity longer term just to deliver uh, a specific purpose, a specific project, a specific function? So sharing your office, sharing your IT function on an ongoing basis. And my main pointer here from a legal perspective would relate to liability and responsibility. Who actually is signing up to what? Who's responsible if you've got a big contract that needs to be paid for to the IT provider year to year? Best idea there really is having a written contract to reflect the terms of the alliance and the collaboration. So moving along then into a more formal merger, further along the spectrum again, a full merger where your two charities will come together and become a single charity. And this is a formal legal process, and there are quite a few legal matters that need to be carefully managed. So the most common merger process to explain how do you actually do it, um, the most common merger process would involve everything that's in Charity A being legally transferred into Charity B. And sometimes that everything is called the undertaking of the charity, all the assets, activities, employees. Um, the Charity A is then empty and is wound up and liquidated and all of its operations are carried out from the, the second charity. If both are companies, this can now happen under the Companies Act or by a contract, which is sometimes called a transfer agreement. And I should say, Neve, that sometimes charities come to us and they say, we're not happy for everything in charity A to go into B because that looks like a takeover. And so sometimes what you can do is incorporate a brand new charity C and everything that's in both, the whole undertaking of A and B coming to see. What sometimes also happens, less common actually, so good to mention it so people are aware, um, is that if you have, for example, a smaller and then a much larger charity in the same space, the smaller charity can, can carry on, keep its registration, keep its legal existence, but come into the group of the bigger charity and so have it as its owner or its parent company. And the charity carries on, it continues to serve its beneficiaries, um, but with this new owner, it gets a lot of benefits. It has the strength of the bigger organization. It can use the services of the bigger organization, all of that. Um, I should say that regardless of where you are on the, on the spectrum of collaboration all the way to merger, there are some common legal requirements. The first one very often overlooked and very important. Does your charity constitution or governing instrument give you the right or the power to enter into this collaboration as charities uh, we are constrained, we cannot just do everything that comes to mind. Our governing instrument is the rule book, so always a check of that. Secondly, to have a legal document to reflect the terms of the collaboration is, is important, um, be it a one page or, or a longer document. And thirdly, it is always necessary to, to have a look around to see are any other areas of law in play. So if you have transferring employees, 
employment law comes in, and, and most people here would be familiar with the CHUPI regulations that protect employees on a transfer. If there's personal data in play, the GDPR uh, applies. I won't go through every other area of law because we'd be here all day, but you get my point. Get the point loud and clear. Thanks, Alice. Alice, if I were to put myself into the shoes of most people who are listening here and they've heard now about the spectrum of collaboration, how do they decide which option they should go for, be it a loose collaboration or a full merger? I know that's slightly ABC, but maybe just to give a flavour. It's, a, it's, um, it's an important point because people are inclined to think um, option A is the right way and option B is the wrong way. And what I'd like to clearly say to everyone this morning is that there is no right or wrong in a generic sense, but there is what's right for you and what's wrong for your charity. And what I can best offer really on that question, Neve, is a litmus test. You know, you have to come back to the first principles positions of charity law to which you are all subject. And you have legal obligations as charity trustees to act in the best interests of your charity and to exercise prudent stewardship of your charity's assets. And those will give you a preliminary sense of what's the right thing to do for us. Um, the duty to, to manage assets, those who receive the Mason Hayes and Curran e might recall, we've given quite a lot of detail over the past couple of years on the legal duties applying to charity trustees um, and I can see in our participants, many of you will have received our training on charity trustee legal duties. And I always highlight in the training that the charity trustees, as opposed to the executive, the CEO, the management team, must appreciate their legal responsibilities. When you sit at the board meeting, the charity trustees should consider any proposed collaboration or merger in the context of what they believe serves the best interests of their charity and whether they believe it is the best use of their charitable assets. And the answer to that will bring through whether a collaboration is right or all, at all, or what is the correct form of collaboration. And, and I, I should say, and I think it has been mentioned earlier on, that that possibility of collaboration around the board table, you actually have a, an obligation now under the CRA governance code to table that annually as an item at a board meeting and to have that discussion, should we collaborate, should we merge? Great, thanks Alice. And you know, it's good to remind everybody that this just isn't pie in the sky talking about should we collaborate or merge, but there actually is a responsibility there on charity trustees to consider it. And Ashling mentioned that as well. And that's a healthy thing for charities to consider this. It's not saying that you have to merge or do anything like that, but it's a healthy thing to consider. Moving swiftly along because we're running slightly tight, Alice, in this fireside chat, the main drivers that we are seeing with our clients as to why they are willing to collaborate or why they want to collaborate or merge, what would they be? I think there are two. Lessening the burden on the individual charities is the first one. Okay, so Ashling mentioned this, governance and compliance have brought so many benefits to our sector, but they have increased the burden. And so collaborating and merging can be a very effective way to share that burden. And Eve knows about this example that we have been dealing with of a group of five charities, two of whom did the exact same thing, one for girls and one for boys, a really old fashioned distinction. And the other three were really complementary purposes. And they had to fill five boards, five governance codes, five accounts. It made complete sense for them to tidy up their house, do a full merger, have a single well-functioning fit for purpose charity with protected reserves for each of the purposes. And um, I, I think that, that that really speaks for itself. Um, outside of, of lessening the burden are the benefits. You know, some people see really clear benefits. Sometimes it's necessary to come together, cash flow, COVID, a combined purpose, a single aim, a single goal, pooling your resources, pooling your knowledge. These are all reasons why charities go ahead with, with collaborations. Great, thanks. Um, Alice, I wonder are there any don'ts? Um, just to give a flavour of what things anybody listening here should absolutely not do in terms of where to start or what steps to take and then regret them. So what we see really as the biggest problem, and of course, you know, people come to lawyers when there are problems, um, but what we see are informal collaborations that grow out of practice and nobody knows who is responsible for what and an issue arises and a fight brews and there's nothing written down. That is the pitfall. 
So even where it's a minor or small scale collaboration, you have to be able to point to your agreement, your document, your letter, whatever it's called, which will say, how long does this go on for? How can we terminate this arrangement? Who's responsible for what? Who's funding? Who's liable for the costs? Who reports on the activities? Who's the employer if you have employees? Who's insuring? All those core questions, if not documented, can really cause issues, Neve. Great. And finally, Alice, um, some pointers on where a charity might start. If somebody's listening today and they're keen to look at collaboration with others, how do they start this journey or process? I think that just comes back to your best practice governance again within your organisation. Naturally, where you have a fully non-exec board, it is the management leadership team and the CEO who are closest to the market, who will have the initial proposal or idea. I think then the getting going should be led by and involve your charity trustees from the get-go. So my how to begin uh, would be to recommend putting a proposal or your idea for collaboration to the board, even just for a 15-minute brainstorm, which we said is, is already required under the CRA governance code. And things you could think about who, who would or could we collaborate with, who's in our area, what would suit our charity? Are we talking about possibly a full merger? Are we talking about way back on the spectrum, just a loose or general sort of alliance? How are our uh, services going? Do we have a good, uh, well-resourced HR finance function or would shared services make a lot of sense for us? I mean, we had a, a group of charities, 17 of them, who just came to us for a particular piece of legal advice recently and dividing the cost by 17. And isn't that fantastic for them? You know, we were able to facilitate that as a complete one off. So opening your mind, I think, to the concept of collaboration is a really good way to begin. We do have some sectors in Ireland, this will be my last word, Neve, which are crowded, you know, for historical reasons, very large number of very small parties. And there I do think boards would do well to assess the field or the sector in which they're operating and, and think, could this just work better for our beneficiaries if the five, six, seven of us that we all know locally came together under the one umbrella? Brilliant, Alice. Thanks a million. Very, very practical and worthwhile thoughts there. And just for everybody who's listening, just really important to remember the responsibilities and duties of the charity trustees. Alice peppered her presentation there in relation to that. So always bring it back to what their role and responsibilities are. Now all, I'm delighted to invite Liz Hughes to the virtual podium. Liz is the CEO of Charities Institute Ireland. Hi, Liz. And Liz is going to tell us about a real collaboration that CII is currently involved in. It will be of great interest and relevance to all of us who are listening in. So Liz, over to you to update us on a real live example of collaboration. Thanks very much, Neve, And thanks to Alice for that very... Sorry, I'm just unmuting myself there. So thanks, Alice, for, for the overview on, on the various legal structures that are available to charities and, of course, the advantages and disadvantages associated with each one. In light of the theme of charities collaborating with each other, I wanted to share um, with you briefly how some of your representative membership and advocacy bodies are working together to highlight the sector's contribution to Irish society. You may recall that in May of last year, the Department of Rural and Community Development announced the COVID Stability Fund, which was a welcome response to a submission made by CII, The Wheel and others requesting a financial support package for organisations within the sector most impacted by the crisis. As reliance on the sector became more evident as the pandemic progressed, we decided to come together again with other leaders and umbrella bodies last summer to discuss the potential of a new public awareness campaign, which focused on the value and the impact of the community, charity and voluntary and social enterprise sector. So to Dan's point, that was our shared goal. So this resulted in the creation of a steering group comprised of the six organisations you see on the slide. So just for reference, you have Board Match, Charities Institute Ireland, Disability Federation of Ireland, DOCUS The Wheel and Volunteer Ireland. The steering group isn't a legal entity. It probably falls under the, the longer project-based alliance that Alice mentioned. However, it was very important that our group was aligned in our ambition for the project 
and had committed to some core principles, including purpose, meeting frequency, attendance and decision making, which we agreed would be consensus led. And again, these principles were outlined in a terms of reference document, which all members of the steering group signed up to. From a practical perspective, we recognise that financial employment and other organisational decisions would need to be made on behalf of the steering group. And we agreed that the wheel as the largest organisation would serve as the administrative and project management home of the campaign. We also agreed that our colleague Sarah Monaghan, campaigns manager within the wheel, would be the campaign director of this collaborative initiative. Following on from that, I'm delighted to know that many other organisations were keen to be involved. And the following organisations are now part of our larger strategic advisory group, which includes Carmichael, Irish Rural Link, I better not forget anybody, Alliance of Age Sector NGOs, the National Youth Council of Ireland, include Cloncredo, the National Federation of Voluntary Bodies, Family Resource National Forum, and Social Entrepreneurs Ireland. And we're going to be expanding and developing this group further over the coming months to ensure as broad a representation of the entire sector as possible. If we go to the next slide, please, Aoife, that'd be great. So what, what's the opportunity? We've come together to address the fundamental lack of understanding of what our sector does, the impact it has, and how that leads to a subsequent lack of appreciation of the value of our work across a variety of audiences. I think we all kind of get that when you don't particularly understand something, it's very difficult to have a significant appreciation for it. We saw an opportunity to challenge and address the issues that the, the sector faces in a new way. We wanted to tackle the lack of understanding and appreciation of the sector. sector. We want to showcase our work more effectively we want to attract the best and brightest to the sector and we want to retain them. And we want our volunteers and staff to be proud of the amazing work that they do. We want greater balance and discussion in the media and we need our policymakers to listen to us more carefully. Uh, so just a, a short little list, but we want to do all of this together. So it, it's not going to, as a campaign, it's not going to directly tackle every problem the sector has but it is intended to address and acknowledge the impact that the lack of public awareness, understanding and appreciation has on the sector. This is an opportunity to build an even bigger, stronger, well, sorry, an even stronger charity and community uh, sector, one that is robust and the buzzword of the moment resilient um, by taking a holistic campaigning approach to the challenges and obstacles we face collectively. And uh, next slide, please, Aoife. Thank you. So our focus is going to demonstrate um, the value and the impact of our work, what it looks like, and what that means to people and to society at large. We know that the most effective way to communicate impact is through storytelling. It's the greatest device we have to connect with people. And while we might like to think that we're very logical beings convinced by stats and data, we know that we are fundamentally led by the heart and the brain just catches up. But luckily, one of the sector's greatest assets is the amazing story that we have to tell. Um, as you can imagine, a campaign like this isn't going to happen overnight. We need time to change hearts and minds. So this campaign could last up to five years. We'll need to identify subsections of the public with messaging that resonates with them. So while the steering group is leading the initiative, we want as many organisations as possible to become involved. Our goal is for the campaign to be a movement for the sector. We will ensure that regardless of the size of your organisation, you'll be able to get involved and make your mark. And that could be anything from, you know, sharing the campaign hashtag through to developing your own impactful story to share on your website or newsletter or through social media, right through to involving your board in this initiative. Once we distill the research and work with our creative agency, we'll have a clearer idea of what areas will make the most difference in raising awareness of the work that we do. And next slide, please, Aoife. So we've two very, very broad objectives, as you can see here. Uh, so the first is to increase awareness and understanding of the nature, breadth and impact of the charity, community and voluntary and social enterprise sector. And the second is improved public perception and appreciation of the value of the sector. 
So they're, they're very broad objectives, but our goal is to distill these into more tangible objectives in time. It all depends on what the public and our charity staff and volunteers perceptions are and what initiatives will have the most impact based on that feedback. Uh, next slide, please, Aoife. So those of us from the steering group and the wider uh, strategic advisory group who were in a position to support a funding application submitted a joint funding application to last September to the Community Foundation Ireland under their uh, RTE Comic Relief Fund. And just before Christmas, we learned that we were successful. So the campaign steering group was allocated funding of 180,000. And this funding will be spent directly on the campaign and under the direction of the steering group observing full transparency at all times. We're in the process of reviewing and collating feedback from two pieces of research, one from the general public and one from the sector. And to those of you on the, on, on the webinar, thank you very much for participating um, in our town halls and in our research. And we've also just recruited a new campaigns officer to work with the steering group in developing and executing the campaign. Again, to ensure that we're in compliance with employment law, et cetera, our campaigns officer will be an employee of the wheel, but completely dedicated to the campaign. So what else are we doing? Well, our partners, the wheel, in partnership with the National Lottery, are hosting a number of storytelling webinars, which are open to all. Um, and the series, which began earlier this month, has two more uh, sessions on offer including how to get heard on the radio and to tell your story through podcasting. And I'll, I'll post that link shortly. Um, another, uh, another update is that following our comprehensive tending, tendering process, we've appointed an agency to deliver content branding work for the campaign. So it's, it's an exciting time for us all. And uh, next slide, please, Aoife. So this is really, um, I suppose, an example of collaboration in action. It, it shows, well, I hope it shows how much can be achieved through cooperation and informal arrangements. Um, and if your plans uh, extend further than an initiative like ours, there are plenty of options that Alice has already alluded to. The important thing uh, to remember is that so much can be achieved by, by working together um, once we have a common goal. So we hope to launch our campaign in October, and uh, probably be towards the end of October. Uh, that 180,000 isn't going to last forever. And if it's a five year campaign, we'll need to secure additional funding. And um, so watch that space. And we would love you to get involved. And um, so there'll be lots more information available on social media. My contact details will be available at the end of the webinar, but we've working groups on, on social media, comms, engagement. Um, so lots of, lots of work to do and uh, lots of opportunities to get involved. So I think that's really all from my side. Um, I'm going to pass back to Neve, who is going to discuss some of the legal issues um, as we plan our return to the workplace with her colleague, Melanie. So thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Liz, very much. Uh, very exciting and obviously a true example of a strategic collaboration in operation. And we definitely look forward to hearing how that all progresses and engaging with you on it. Next up is my colleague, uh, Melanie Crowley. Melanie is head of our employment and benefits team here in Mason, Hayes and Curran. As you can guess, Melanie is going to talk about employment and specifically about returning to the workplace. And depending on what leader and vice leader and all the rest you listen to, that could be any time between July, August and September, but hopefully soon enough. Um, you may wish to have your pens ready. We're not doing slides for this because we just felt we'd fit more in in terms of tips and guidelines if Melanie and, Melanie and I just speak. So pens at the ready because I think you'll definitely get some good advice out of this. So Melanie, I'll cut to the chase. Some employees have absolutely loved working from home and would love to continue to do so. Can their employer refuse a request from them to work remotely? And secondly, if like me, I'm not that enthused about working from home at all, can an employer mandate the likes of me to continue to work remotely? First part first, Neve. Um, yes, an employer can refuse an employee's right to request, uh, sorry, a right to work. I'll start again. Yes, an employer can refuse an employee's request to work remotely. Um, every employer has a statutory obligation to provide certain information to employees in writing 
that information is usually enshrined in, in the contract of employment. And one of those pieces of information is the employee's place of work. So for you and I and, and Alice, our place of work is Barrow Street, Dublin 4. Um, and that's our place of work. And that's a contractual place of work. And to change something that fundamental in the contract of employment needs collaboration um, and needs agreement and needs the consent of, of both parties. Now, there is legislation coming down the tracks. There's been lots of talk about it over the course of the last few months. And that legislation will be around the right to request remote working. Um, we don't know what it's going to look like yet, but I suspect what it might look like is there's a code of practice on a right to request um, part-time working. And that code of practice says that employers who get a request for part-time working should consider the request and then should look at things like kind of the, the, the cost for the organization, the impact on the rest of the team, the practical implications, how that part-time working fits in the organization. So I suspect the legislation, once it's passed around the right to request remote working, will be, will be similar to that. So at the moment, no obligation to accede to a request to work remotely. And even when the legislation comes in, there still won't be an obligation, but there will be a higher onus on employers to consider the request. And to the second part of your question then, can an employer insist on an employee working remotely? And actually, it's, it's a very good question because lots of clients have come and said, we're thinking about shutting our office. We just don't know if we want to bear the cost of having a building in Dublin 2 or Dublin 1 or wherever it is. And everybody's working remotely. We're thinking about let, making them stay at home. Can we insist on that? And the answer to that is no, an employer cannot insist on it. Um, and that's because, again, the place of work is a fundamental part of the contract of employment. And to change it needs agreement. So the employer needs the employee's agreement to change the place of work from the building in Dublin too, or wherever it is, or Galway or Cork or wherever the building is, to the employee's home um, place of work and there's two other things I'll say about that first of all you know if you look at the definition of redundancy um, and there's five subsections to the definition of redundancy one of them if an, is it kind of encompasses a situation where an employer ceases to work in a particular place so it could end up in a redundancy situation so that's the first point I would make because I think it's worth considering before getting into that space where you want to mandate remote working rather than agreeing it with the employee but the other thing I want to think I, I want, you know, everybody listening to think about is the fact that an employee is working remotely doesn't change any of the employer's obligations, whether it's, you know, the room at the back of the kitchen or me, you're obviously in your attic with your Velux windows. It is it's still a place of work. And that means it's covered by an employer's health and safety obligations. There's still an, 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 an obligation on an employer to assess the remote workplace consideration needs to be given to you know, the provision of equipment, who's going to provide the desk and the chair, who's going to make sure the room is adequately ventilated and heated. What about things like insurance? Um, how do you ensure a level of engagement or where, you know, with colleagues, with the team, if, if work is fully remote? So all of those kind of things have to be considered, but they all have to be considered collaboratively with the employee as well. And that engagement is going to be increasingly important, I think. Very good. And I suppose from a corporate law perspective as well, if everybody's working remotely, just a reminder to everybody who's listening in about registered office requirement with the company registration office, place of business requirement with the charities regulators. So it's just not all about the employment side either, just to bear in mind. But got that, mm -hmm. Melanie, thanks. Vaccines, Melanie, can an employer prohibit an employee who hasn't been vaccinated from returning to work? Yeah, and... and that's not a question where there's a very, very straightforward yes and no, like there was with the previous question. Um, probably not is the short answer. The whole vaccination issue is tricky and it's fraught with difficulties. But if you, stay, if you take a step back and kind of look at the wider societal piece, the vaccination program in Ireland, like most European countries, is a voluntary program. Um, and the reason that it's a voluntary program is because the whole vaccination issue is, you know, it brings together a whole load of competing priorities because, you know, employees have a constitutional right to bodily integrity. So they, they don't want to be vaccinated. There's an impact there. There's a European Convention on Human Rights, which provides everybody with the, with the right to a private life. 
there's considerations around kind of medical and religious concerns would bring a whole host of equality and discrimination issues. And then all of those have to balance against the rights of society and kind of general public safety. So that's why the vaccination, you know, across Europe and most of the world is, is, um, is voluntary. Um, on the upside, statistically, as I understand it, Ireland has one of the highest rates of vaccination uptake uh, in the world. Um, but in circumstances where it's voluntary, it's not easily and readily open to an employer to mandate that employees are vaccinated before they come back into the kind of corporate office space, if you like. Um, there is a right to work protocol. The government issued it last May, May 2020, when we were all kind of heading back in, you know, getting ready to head back into the office during the course of last summer. Um, but that return to work protocol was updated and reissued in May 2021. Um, when it comes to vaccinations, the, the protocol is a little bit woolly. It, it recommends that employers, you know, provide advice and educate their workforce around the benefits of vaccination. But it does still acknowledge that there may be circumstances where it might be unsafe to have an unvaccinated employee in the middle of a group of vaccinated employees or in certain parts of the workplace. So my advice to employers would be to kind of not make a call on it because most of the people who are listening to us today won't be qualified to make a call. So it's something organizations and employers, I think, need to go to their health and safety consultants because everybody did a risk assessment last year when they were thinking about having people, you know, getting people back into the office post kind of our first lockdown. And if that risk assessment wasn't done, it should definitely be done now. And it should be updated now. And that whole piece around vaccinated and mixing vaccinated and unvaccinated employees um, will have to be considered. And, and, and what happens if somebody's not vaccinated? Can that employee be redeployed to a different part of the organization? Can that employee be put into kind of a, a separate room? Can we look at you know, will, will things like social distancing and mask wearing and minimizing interactions, physical interactions in the workplace help reduce the risk? If that's not possible, can the employee be accommodated in longer term remote working? Um, and then there's a medical concerns and medical issues. So if there are, then, you know, and the protocol talks about this as well, it talks about collaborating with the employee, engaging with the employee's general practitioner or medical advisors, and then, if, if in doubt, going to the organisation's own occupational health advisor and, and getting advice there. So it's, it's, it's again, and we're using this word a lot today, but that's what today is about. It's collaboration between the employer, the employee, the occupational health advisors, the medical advisors and, and, and the health and safety consultants as well. And, and I'm conscious as I'm saying this, that most organisations will have fairly constrained budgets. Um, when it comes to having cash to spend on things like this, but employees' health and safety is, is so fundamental that it's, it's a place where cash is going to have to be spent and resources are going to have to be expended in, in getting that piece right. Great, thanks, definitely. Jeepers, a bit of a minefield there with the yeah. vaccines, definitely. Melanie, I have a few other questions that I really wanted to ask you about pregnant people not wanting to come back, about the right to disconnect other things. If you don't mind, I'm going to leave them to the Q&A at the end because we're just running about five minutes over and I want to give Adrienne and Thomas obviously their time as well. So apologies for that. And for those listening, we will go back to those other questions because I know some of them specifically, Melanie, were things that people asked um, when they were registering, but thank you very much. So we just folks have two speakers left. I'm going to ask the first of them, please, to join the podium. And here's Adrienne. Adrienne Harton is a colleague of Ashling's in PwC. Adrienne is a consultant in PwC and a member of their executive search team. As part of her consultancy role, Adrienne advises charities on, if you like, the softer skills about the return to work, issues like well-being, etc. So very different to the hard legal things that Melanie was talking about. But I'll hand over to Adrienne. And Adrienne and if I can ask you to maybe just, you know, speak as fast as you can while we can all still okay. understand, because we all really want to hear everything you have to say. Thanks a million. I'm hoping everybody can see me. Very good. Thank you, Melanie and Neve, and certainly plenty of really interesting and compelling issues there to consider around the whole area of return to work. As it happens, I'm actually here in the office myself 
and Spencer Dock. So hello, everyone. Great to have the opportunity to speak to you today on the topic of the workforce of the future. Just very quickly to introduce myself, as, as Neve has mentioned, I'm a senior manager with PwC's People and Organization Practice, and I'm also a member of the executive search team. So we have many years experience working with decision makers across the public and private and not-for-profit sectors, making senior level executive and board appointments for organizations such as Goal, the Irish Cancer Society, Family Cares Ireland, and Rehab. But we work very closely with our colleagues in the wider P&O practice around all organizational change and workforce issues. And today I'm looking at the theme of collaboration, but through the lens of how organizations leaders and teams can plan for and shape the workforce of the future. So if I can just move to the next slide there, Aoife. Uh, coming into 2020, the future of work was driven by big themes like globalization, digital transformation and Brexit. But as we all now know, the real disruptor came in the form of a global pandemic and COVID-19 has completely changed the way we work. Leaders and teams will need to collaborate extensively to respond to the challenges and opportunities the pandemic has presented in order to successfully shape the workforce of the future. And this slide gives just three broad areas that have emerged. The emphasis on employee well-being, a greater sense of community, collaboration and feeling connected. A new employment relationship, a bigger focus on social responsibility, changes in leadership style as team teams work remotely, the need to have a much deeper understanding of your workforce. And finally, and most obvious of which is the shift to a remote, flexible and digitally enabled workforce as a cultural norm. I'm moving on again there, Aoife. In order to better understand what has emerged in the past year, PwC conducted an extensive hopes and fear survey of over 32 and a half thousand people in 19 countries across the globe between January and February of 2021. Respondents included full-time and part-time workers as well as the unemployed and while there are many interesting results that came through I've chosen just one to present here and that is that 42 percent responded to say that they did not want to go back to the way it was before the pandemic and this really reflects how worker professionals preferences have changed and that this will be the main driver of transformation in the way people work over the next three to five years. So moving on again there, so how does an organization then go about addressing these issues? Ultimately it's about going back to basics, asking fundamental questions of your organization, understanding what's changing and what your organization needs to do to evolve. How do we define and measure outputs, for example, in a post-pandemic era? How do we balance well-being and productivity, looking at individual preferences as against those of the team and the organizational needs? How to cultivate a sense of certainty and drive innovation? Looking at the not-for-profit sector, for example, this really is a sector that had to innovate very quickly around issues such, such as fundraising through a pandemic. And ultimately, there is an opportunity to learn from the pandemic, take a step back and develop a workplace strategy that is fit for the future. So in terms of the future of work and the hybrid challenge or the new abnormal, as many are calling it, PwC suggests taking a strategic approach around four specific areas, work type, what kind of work we do, the remote ability of that work, workforce, what kind of workforce do we need, looking at issues such as diversity and inclusion, analyzing the skills and capabilities of the workforce. Workplace, how do our workplaces enable our people? Taking a closer look at ergonomics, for example, in the workplace and the actual physical infrastructure of the office, does it facilitate collaboration, which can be the primary purpose of the workplace? And at the core of all of the above is the experience of work, how we energize and inspire our people. Does the work itself provide purpose and meaning? What kind of culture does the organization have? What's the societal impact? really taking a closer look at the organization's values and behaviors. So just moving on there again, the, this framework or strategy then takes the form of seven core principles as outlined on this slide, as an approach that organizations can build on. Being holistic and comprehensive, really looking at the organization in its entirety, its end-to-end -end processes and policies really leave no stone unturned. Be action-oriented, really focus on outcomes, be data-driven, 
This is about being evidence-based, using data analytics, for example, if that facility is available. Be culture-oriented and be at the intersection of human and tech. It's really not an either or here. It's the intersection of both. The tech capability is, of course, a priority, but equally important are the human capabilities of creativity, innovation, empathy, and, of course, collaboration. Acknowledge the economic context, what are the external economic issues that are impacting or will impact the operations of the organization, and acknowledge the social impact issues such as climate change, diversity and inclusion again, and for corporate social, social responsibility also. But when taking this step back and strategic approach, it makes sense to look at what other organizations are considering and doing. And PwC has been gathering insights from clients and contacts over the course of the pandemic. No one has all the answers here. This is really a constantly evolving and dynamic situation. So there's an obvious effort going on to stay in touch with employee needs as they evolve. And this is something that PwC has been doing on a consistent basis right throughout the pandemic. We call them pulse surveys, really simple Google enabled surveys that take the temperature of all members of staff in terms of how they're feeling about the return to work you know, what kind of shape that should take, what choices they would make and so on. And organizations are also looking at where there might be quick wins, such as making the PA role, for example, fully virtual or fully remote and changing HR and people policies to better reflect a new reality. Our own people and organization team experienced this when one team member began wor working remotely from India, another one um, decided to work remotely from UK. And this is all about being with family during lockdown. You know, this has real implications for the firm should team members choose to work remotely, particularly if it's outside the EU, for extended periods of time. And then there's the move to greater digitization. And we've all seen cloud-based services, for example, coming into their own, allowing teams to collaborate remotely. But there are, of course, cybersecurity issues here. And organizations are obviously putting much more focus and resources into cybersecurity as a result. So to conclude, I've outlined four key actions here to consider when taking a closer look at your organization's readiness for the workforce of the future. Firstly, collaborate, lead consciously, really think about your organization's ambition, involving and collaborating with your people to clarify your organization's vision. Redefine what work is and what, how it gets done. For example, um, you know, looking back at the hopes and fears survey again, when it came to technology, 77% indicated uh, uh, readiness to learn new skills or retrain. But this, of course, will have implications in terms of resourcing and budgeting for new training programs. And where does the work get done? Can it be carried out in different ways across multiple workplaces? But this means organizations really need to get clear on the definition of work. Co-create the future. Again, collaboration is a key priority here, engaging with the work to plan for the post-pandemic world of work, but I also expect to see an increase in movement of talent. Many employees will look for something new and different as they come out of the pandemic and lockdown, and this will mean finding new ways to engage, retain, and attract key talent. Um, adopt a test and learn mindset. Again, this is going back to the fact that no one has all the answers here. We need to use this opportunity to define a new path and really embrace the big experiment that is the workforce of the future. Finally, I'd like to leave you with the thought that the future of work post-pandemic, it's leadership led, it's leadership lived, but it's also about teams, collective efforts and how collaboration and creativity can flourish in offline and online contexts across public, private and not-for-profit sectors. Thank you very much. I'll hand you back to Neve now to introduce the next speaker. Great. Many thanks, Adrienne. That was great. I love some of your terminology, hopes and fears and test and learn. Um, it's great, wonderful and all in line with our theme of collaboration. I'm now going to ask our final speaker to join us, Thomas Mulholland. What the rest of you won't know is Thomas was locked out of his computer there for a while. So I'm very happy to see you back on the screen, Thomas. You'll probably see that we're running slightly over. So my apologies that you're coming in at this late stage. Thomas is Director of Compliance and Enforcement with the charities regulator. So it's wonderful to have you here today. And I'll hand over to you, Thomas. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Neve. So I've been asked to um, have a talk today, talk to you about uh, emergers, alliances and partnerships in the context of the governance code. 
So if we move on to the, uh, to the next slide, um, the first thing I want to cover is what is the Charities Governance Code? And hopefully everybody, all uh, trustees, all charities would be aware of the Charities Governance Code at this stage. It was launched in 2018 and it sets out six basic, basic principles of governance, which all charities should apply. So really, the Charities Governance Code is about having good governance in charities. You often hear the phrase good governance in relation to organisations, especially charities. And the question is, what does good governance mean? And this is what the Charities Governance Code sets out. Um, it's... There are six principles in the Charities Governance Code, um, and they are advancing the charitable purpose, behaving with integrity, leading people, exercising control, working effectively, and being accountable. And each of these principles then have uh, standards within each principle. So um, that's just a quick run over of the uh, overview of the Charities Governance Code. Uh, I'm not going to go into much more detail on it, but just to be aware, as some of the speakers previously have mentioned the Charities Governance Code and the fact that charities are required to report on their compliance with the Charities Governance Code on their annual report to the Charities Regulator in 2021, in the current year. Okay, and on the next slide then, you'll see uh, under the, the Charities Governance Code, one of the principles, and again, it was, it was briefly mentioned in some of the previous speakers, that from time to time, the Charities Governance Code, is, is, it sets out that charities should consider the advantages and disadvantages of working with partnership with other charities, including mergers or, or dissolving. Now, what that means is that it should be just a topical conversation. It should be a, a, a discussion at board level uh, for charities, um, perhaps once a year. And we're not saying that charities have to merge or they have to work in partnership with other charities. We're just saying it should be considered as an option. And it's very often um, something like this can be used as a catalyst, as a starting point for charities, maybe to bring up a, a topic like marriage earn or working with other charities. Um, so in relation to the Charities Governance Code, obviously we get a lot of questions in relation to the Charities Governance Code. And there's a frequently, frequently asked questions section on the um, website. And one of the frequently asked questions is in relation to working in partnership. So what does working in partnership mean? And the answer to the question, and again, it's, it was it was touched upon by previous speakers, is that working in partnership can mean anything from working in an, a, a, an informal arrangement, a once-off arrangement, to uh, having a, 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 a long-term relationship, um, a, a large fundraising drive, perhaps with another charity. And even uh, something as simple as this webinar today, this is an example of an informal event, perhaps a charity, a number of charities could get together to have a webinar, um, to, get, to work together in um, for their common goals. So on the next slide, um, you'll see that in relation to uh, working in partnership and indeed for any activity of a charity, the starting point should always be, what is it you tend to achieve? What, how are you going to further the purpose of your charity by working in partnership with another charity? So it's, it's, it's always a good idea to take a high level view, to kind of stand back and think, why are we working with partnership with another charity, what is it that we're going to achieve? Um, is it going to be an effective use of your charity resources? Is it in the interest of the charity? And um, again, is it prohibited by your charity's government documents? So your constitution, is, is it allowed uh, to work in partnership with another charity? Is it within the rules of your organization? And if a charity is considering working with other um, organizations, then they have to identify and um, and uh, work uh, any risks that's on, that are involved. On the next slide, then um, you'll see that um, as the level of collaboration increases, a, form, a more formal legal agreement will become necessary, and that makes sense. If you, if there's going to be a, a large um, a, a large fundraiser going to be uh, put in place between two charities, it would make sense for a legal agreement to be put in place. It would need to be discussed at board level to make sure that um, it's been agreed at board level that a partnership is, is, is in order and it's been noted in the minutes of the of meeting. And care needs to be shared, to, to be exercised in sharing information. And again, I think it was previously mentioned, even saying something as simple like, like this webinar here, you know, if charities are going to be sharing something as simple as the um, their email addresses, their contact addresses to ad advertise the webinar, you know, is that allowed under GDPR? Um, so these things, you, you may need to get professional or legal advice into, into matters like that. So on the next slide, um, we're talk, uh, we were talking previously about, you know, ch charities working in partnership. And again, at the other end of the scale is charities who go the go go complete route and decide to merge. 
So there, uh, there's a, plenty of reasons why charities can merge, you know, due to um, increased efficiencies, margins of strength, in order to become a kind of a more all Ireland charity, uh, charity, you know, a charity in Munster may decide to, to merge with a charity in Dublin, just merely so they can extend their reach over the entire country. And on our website, there's a document called Guidance for Charities, uh, uh, sorry, Guidance on Winding Up a Charity. It's in our Guidance for Charities section, and it's a very comprehensive document. And in that document, there's a section in relation to merging charities. Um, and the reason that it's in that document is that uh, often when a charity merge, one charity or perhaps both charities may um, may have to wind up and, and a new charity will, will have to be registered. So uh, merging charities um, very often um, uh, is connected to winding up a charity. So on your next slide, you'll see um, that uh, if two charities are merging, the normal scenario is that one charity incorporates the other. And it's normally that the one charity will incorporate the other. Um, it's crucial for the winding up of charities that uh, it's done properly so to avoid any risk of problems for future for the board trustees. Now, the process of winding up, the actual technical aspect of it depends on uh, when the CHY number for the charity was, uh, was received. So if the charity received its CHY number before the 16th of October 2014, the revenue commissioners are the uh, first protocol for the a charity that's winding up. They will go through the winding up process with the revenue commissioners. If the charity has received its CHY number after the 16th of October 2014, uh, it should contact the, regu the charity's regulator. There's a form available on our uh, website in our my account for that charity and you can fill in the form and the charity's regulator will oversee the, the winding up of that charity. So charities may, when they um, combine, they may decide to rename or rebrand. Re and again, there's a, a form available on the charities regulator website in their My Account, which allows charities to apply to change their name on the register of charities. So on the next slide, you'll see for merging charities, there's a lot of reasons why um, charities should, um, uh, or a lot of things that charities need to think about when they're merging. And there's a whole list of reasons there from the, you must make sure that the constitutions of the charities align, that there's a, a obtain approval from members, you know, outstanding tax returns will have to be um uh, will have to be filed. Ensuring this is an important one here, ensuring that the winding up a transfer of assets doesn't trigger a tax liability. Um, you know, if a CHY number is cancelled, that it doesn't uh, can't trigger a tax liability. And again, legal or professional advice should be sought. So there's, a, like I say, there's a whole risk, host of um, things to think about if char charities are going to merge. And again, some of the previous speakers have touched on the importance of that and um, some of the factors that have to be thought about. And, you know, perhaps one of the biggest things with in relation to employees, employees, there's a, a huge number of things to think about in relation to employees, about payroll, about pensions, about transfer of undertaking. So merging charities, obviously, is a, is a very serious uh, issue that has to be thought of carefully. By, by both charities. So on the next slide then, um, in relation to the charities regulator, the charities regulator doesn't really have um, a, a much of a role in relation to mergers or takeovers. Really, it's more um, about uh, getting the, um, the, the register, the, 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 reg the charities details on the register of charities updated to reflect the fact that the uh, charities have merged. So that may, like I said previously, may involve one of the charges being um, um, wound up and that would be taken off the register or perhaps renamed. So the charities regulator main role is in keeping the, um, the register of charities up to date. But there is, a, a, charities would normally notify us if there's um, any, uh, if, they, if they intend to merge. And listed on the slide there is the kind of information we would need for, um, uh, in order to keep track of charities who are going to, to merge. Um, it's not normally required for the charges regulator to approve of a merge or as such. Um, though the, the charges would oftentimes contact the charges regulator just to see if there's any particular issue in relation to the merging of a charity. Um, in relation to the number of mergers that we've been dealing with, there haven't been a, a, a large number. It does come up occasionally, but it's not something that uh, comes up um, very often. But when it does, we obviously we deal as, as they uh, as issues like that come to light. So on the next slide, then, so um, 
Finally, then, it's always the charities regulator. We also welcome the opportunity to talk to charities, to charity trustees. So there are, uh, uh, I'm just three topics, um, areas of interest I briefly want to mention, uh, uh, just when we have, to have the opportunity of talking to charities and charity trustees. The first is in relation to the declaration of compliance with the Charities Governance Code. As I mentioned, and as previous speakers mentioned, it's now compulsory for charities to declare on their annual report whether or not they're in compliance with, it, with the Charities Governance Code. Now, um, those declarations are obviously monitored and we actually um, take a sample of declarations and, and request um, backup information for that. So they are monitored, there are checks being carried out. And just to let charities know, um, it's, it's, it, there is the option to, to um, notify the charges regulator that you're not in compliance with the charges, uh, over the, with the charges governance code for whatever reason. And you know we work with charities in that situation or, or try to assist them. But just to let you know, it's not acceptable for a charity to declare that it's in compliance with the charges governance code when it's not. Okay, so um, just making that point. Um, on the next slide, then the last two things I just want to briefly mention are in relation to areas of transparency under the charges governance code. Um, all charities are expected to be fully transparent about their operations, about their finances, and we would uh, encourage and expect charities to have their full financial statements available on their website. And it's just um, for charities or companies. Charities or companies can file what's called their abridged accounts, which are a smaller set of accounts in the company's register in the CRO, in the company's register, registration office. Now, we would again, we would expect charities to file their full financial accounts in the CRO, not the abridged accounts. And um, it's uh, we would ask uh, charity trustees to instruct their accountants or their filing agents, whoever's filing their returns in the CRO, to make sure it's their full accounts that are filed in, in the CRO. And the last item I'm going to uh, briefly mention is in relation to the um, to charities and running of charities. And just to make it clear, it's come up on a, on a number of occasions recently that there's been some uh, confusion or some it hasn't been absolutely clear to charities exactly who is running charities. And the, there's a, there's a, the simple answer is charity trustees are in charge of char charities. The CEO or employees of of, of of charities are are exactly that. They're the CEO, they're employees of the charity, and they're they're answerable to the charity <laughs> trustees. So just to let everybody know that, make it clear that it's an item that's like I say, it's come up on a, on a number of times recently that um, charity trustees are in charge of one of the charities. So with that, I'm going to hand you back to Neve, and um, I thank you very much. Many thanks, Thomas. Um, that was absolutely great. You covered off so many points there. Great to see um, the approach from the regulator's office in relation to collaboration, etc. is very much in the same vein of what we've all been talking about. Um, the guidelines that you mentioned, we are constantly referring our clients to the guidelines. You sometimes do us out of a bit of work. To be honest, they're so good, but they're a really great resource. So anybody who's listening today, especially charity trustees, you should be very familiar with the guidelines that are up on the charity regulators website. Also great to hear about how you are dealing with those um, governance codes that have come in and the tick, if you like, that uh, charity is fully compliant. Um, we must remind all our clients that are ticking uh, that this will be checked. Um, but I know that a huge amount of work is going into the adoption of the governance code and it will take time, um, but it will definitely lead to better compliance by everybody. Full financial statements completely get where you're coming from there. And we'll again push out the message in that regard. But thank you very much. Um, that's the end, everybody, of our formal presentations. I can see lots and lots of questions have been coming in. We have about five minutes on the questions. So everybody, all of our speakers are back up on the screen and you can see all of their contact details there on the screen in front of you. Reminder, you will get a copy of a link to this document um, over the next few days. And if I can also mention to you, that if you feel some of your questions haven't been answered in the presentations and you, uh, we don't have a chance to answer them in the next few minutes, there is a survey that will be sent around to all of you. And in that survey, please feel free to raise your questions then. Or if you want to send your questions to me and I'll share them between the group and the most relevant person will come back to you. 
Um, I appreciate that Adrienne's camera wasn't working. Adrienne, you're there now. Um, so yes, you're there. I'm going to ask um, Adrienne to be unmuted or to unmute herself. And in the interests of fairness and screen time, Adrienne, I'm going to give you the first question that came in that's relevant to you. And the question that's come in, Adrienne, is what do you think will be the success criteria for being a good leader in the workplace of the future? Thanks very much, Neve, and hello to everyone. Apologies for the technical difficulty earlier. Um, well, listen, working with the PwC executive search practice in the people and organization team, we encounter leaders um, and those that seek to become leaders uh, of, organ of organizations across a wide range of sectors. But really, there are some common factors there. And what we found that organizations aspire to successfully transfor transform um, are leaders that a can inspire confidence and, and really have a, a level of humility and self-awareness that enables them to relate uh, to their peers to their to their entire workforce really um, at all levels there is something there about being tech savvy you know i mean none of us are experts but we we know um the level we're at and where you know there's room to improve and i think in the world we're living in at the moment it really is essential to be aware of our own levels of capability around technology and make up the gaps where we can um having high integrity and trust you know that's absolutely essential in a change and transformation journey really to bring the people along with them on that journey um, but ultimately it's about communication and being that ability to communicate to engage so that the really essential collaboration with colleagues can take place effectively. Great, thanks Adrienne. And collaboration is obviously key in everything we're talking about today. But I agree with you, um, you know, leaders have had to show empathy and integrity in ways that we never thought we'd have to in the past. That sounds slightly mean, but that's the reality of it in dealing with everybody that we are encountering and meeting with these days. Um, Melanie, I wanted to go back to you very quickly and really quickly, if you can, the right to disconnect. I know it's slightly left of COVID, but we have all found it difficult to disconnect because the machine is blinking on our kitchen table for the last 12 months. But at the same time, if somebody on the team suddenly said to me, Neve, I have my right to disconnect now and we're in the middle of getting a piece of work out, I'd kind of be furious. How do we deal with that? unmute myself um <laughs> it would help um yeah it's it's a challenge um it, it's definitely a challenge need we have legislation in ireland since 1997 called the organization of working time act which places an obligation on employers to make sure employees don't work over 48 hours a week have proper rest breaks of holidays um, and there's an obligation there, a statutory obligation on all employers and it doesn't matter if you're the corner shop across the road or ibm or a charity to record working time um, and to have those records available. Um, and then since the 1st of April, we have this code of practice on the right to disconnect. And that code of practice says three things in the main. It says that an employee shouldn't regularly be required to work after their normal working time. So it's not a complete ban. It's just that they won't, employees won't regularly be required to, to, to log on in the evening if that's the case. The second thing the code says is that employees won't be penalized if they refuse to work outside of their normal working hours. And the third thing the code says is that employers um, should be conscious of the employee's working time. And then it talks about having a, a you know, a policy and, you know, um, training people and how to use technology um, to, to Adrian's point there, including putting things like delays on email and being respectful about employees working time. Um, I have been publicly fairly critical of it, I have to say, um, uh, and, and some people will, will know that because they'll, they'll have heard me speaking about it before. I think, uh, you know, at the back end of a global pandemic, when we've spent 15 months working from home and we've done it, you know, with very, you know, in, 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 at, with, with very short notice at the beginning, but very rudimentary kind of um, equipment, if you like, also at the beginning, but when we've had to manage, you know, kids at the kitchen island and trips to the supermarket at times where there mightn't be big queues and uh, opportunity to get some fresh air and go for our walks within our 2K or whatever it was. I think we have shown as a nation and as a society and a 
culture and across the globe that employees know, you know, how to manage their own work, what has to be done and when they have to deliver it by. And on the one hand, we're saying, well, we're going to give people the right to request remote working and, and you know, we're encouraging flexibility and we've all shown that people can take um, ownership and that increased flexibility brings with that increased productivity. But how am I going to go for a run at 11 o'clock in the morning, collect the kids from school, do the supermarket run, and then and then log back in the evening after they've gone to bed if I have to have all my work done by six o'clock and disconnect at six o'clock? So I, I don't get it. I, I'm cross about it, actually. But it is something employers are going to have to be conscious of. Yeah, very good. Thank you. All, I'm sorry, but we have come to the end of our scheduled time. I know we have more questions and I know all of the speakers on the screen would love to be able to answer the questions. But in my formal role as chair, I have to just keep to the time. Um, please do share the questions with me and we will answer the questions because we're very keen to do that. And another thing that you might like to do on the survey, if you are responding to it, is let us on the screen know what other topics you'd like us to talk about in future events like this. I know we've often talked about the role and responsibility of charity trustees and Thomas mentioned it a lot. If that's something that you think that another session would be good on, obviously mention that. So that's it. Um, a final thank you to all of our speakers for all of the time that they've given and a huge thank you to our audience and clients and friends who have dialed in. We're very grateful. I wish you all great fortune, patience, excitement and everything else that will go with the return to work. I really encourage you to speak with other charities, engage with them, collaborate. It might, you know, come to absolutely nothing. But what have you to lose? I mean, the most you have to lose is spending half an hour having a coffee with somebody and it doesn't amount to some anything. But Jeepers, a couple of months ago, wouldn't we have given our right hand, you know, to go and have a cup of coffee with somebody? So we're really losing nothing. So that's it. Um, thank you all very much. And it was my pleasure to be both your chair and your host. Thank you. Thank you.